It's 10 o'clock, this is Sky News at 10, our top story. Asylum seekers are removed from the Bibby Stock home after four days due to traces of Legionella bacteria found in the water system. The evacuation is a setback for the government's immigration policy as a record 750 people are detected crossing the channel in small boats yesterday. Also tonight, an inquiry is launched into the treatment of women in the custody of Greater Manchester Police after an investigation by Sky News. The stories of survival. Residents of the town worst hit by the Hawaii wildfires allowed to return briefly tonight, but still 1,000 people are missing and at least 55 dead. We're going in and out of consciousness ourselves in the water and we were both hallucinating. Um, but I just remember holding her hand and telling each other every few minutes, like, Edna, are you awake? Wake up. Junior doctors strike for a fifth time. The action is expected to delay one million procedures and appointments. And we'll be live in Sydney ahead of the Lionesses World Cup quarterfinal clash. But can the team overcome the latest hurdles? Plus, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's in the press preview from 10.30. A very good evening. Thanks for joining us. The asylum seekers who boarded the Bibby Stockholm barge in Dorset just a few days ago have been removed. Sky News understands that earlier this week the Legionella bacteria was found in the vessel's water supply. The Home Office says nobody has fallen ill, but the 39 people who have been living on board the barge have now been relocated as a precaution. The barge was a big part of the government's plans to tackle immigration, with record numbers still crossing the channel on small boats. We'll have more on that in a moment. Our correspondent Dan Whitehead has tonight's first report from Portland. They've only spent four nights on board, but now the 39 asylum seekers moved on to the Bibby Stockholm on Monday and back on dry land. They left by coach on Friday night, heading back to hotels. The water on board the barge contaminated with Legionella bacteria that can lead to Legionnaire's disease, an outbreak that was first revealed by Sky News. We understand that on the 25th of July, Legionella tests were carried out on the Bibby Stockholm. Then on Monday the 7th of August, the day the first asylum seekers boarded, the results of the tests were received by those contracted to run the barge. But it wasn't until two days later that the Home Office were made aware of the results. On Thursday night, following formal advice from the UK Health Security Agency, the Home Office said it would remove all those on board as a precaution. As the news unfolded, campaigners were back at the gates of Portland Port. Those in contact with individuals on board say they're concerned. I think it's going to be really unsettling for them and um, very difficult. Um, one of the asylum seekers phoned me up and said he was really worried because he had just drunk the water and asked if he could give me his family's details um, because in case anything happened to him. 500 people on a small island of 13 and a half, plus a tourist uh, area next door. Yes, of course we're concerned. And we're also concerned about the welfare of the people on the barge, but much more so than the people on our island. Health experts warn the nature of Legionella means it can be difficult to identify how and where it is caught. This is about infected, um, in infected water droplets being inhaled and that's actually why people sometimes don't even know or can't recall where the interaction might have been. Even on Tuesday, the day after the initial test results and first arrivals, we saw work being carried out on the Bibby. The Home Office says that the removal of the migrants is only temporary, but the timing could not be worse. The fact that we were here on Monday after months of delays for the first arrivals, and now we end the week with the barge empty, will come as a huge frustration to the government. In a statement, the Home Office said no individuals on board have presented with symptoms of legionnaires and asylum seekers are being provided with appropriate advice and support. The samples taken relate only to the water system on the vessel itself and therefore carry no direct risk indication for the wider community of Portland, nor do they relate to fresh water entering the vessel. Further tests are now being carried out. The question now 
is whether the bibby can be made safe and how long that will take. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Portland, Dorset. Well, it was uh, confirmed today that more than 100,000 people have now been detected crossing the English Channel since January 2018. 755 people were seen making the dangerous journey yesterday, the highest number recorded this year. So far this year, 15,826 people have arrived in the UK after crossing the channel. Well, let's go now to our political correspondent, Nick Martin, who is outside the Home Office. Nick, this is a big setback, isn't it, for the government's plans to tackle immigration? Yes, because if you remember, this week really was all about sort of stopping the boats, the government stamping its authority on its kind of floundering immigration plan. And the beginning of the week, which saw the doors opened to that barge and the first people going on was meant to be a sign that things were moving away from those expensive hotels. Remember, the government says we're spending £6 million a day housing asylum seekers. That's why the barge was brought in. And here we are at the end of the week, and that plan is in tatters. I think it's fair to say that this is a temporary setback. Experts say that it'll take a couple of days to flush that system and get that barge back up and running. But what's absolutely intriguing are the timings. Who knew about the test results and when? And how on earth did, were people allowed to go onto that barge when somebody somewhere knew that there was Legionella in the system? The whole immigration plan for the government is in tatters. Remember, their Rwanda plan is bogged down in the Supreme Court. It's trying to stop the boats, but you've just said that those numbers are still very high. And here we have it, this barge, the sort of big answer to cutting down those costs, is now sitting empty tonight. It is looking, as the days go on and the weeks go on, that the government is struggling to justify this kind of immigration policy, but it has no choice. Labour, on the other hand, are calling this a disaster. But if you ask them whether they would have barges, they admit that it is a potential solution. So at the end of this week, it's going to be very difficult to look and see where the government goes from this. But the barge will be up, back up and running, no doubt. It's saving the government so much money, it has no choice. Nick, in Westminster, thank you. An independent inquiry into the experience of women and girls in police custody in Greater Manchester has been commissioned following a Sky News investigation. The inquiry will have a particular focus on the use of strip searches and removal and replacement of clothing after a woman told us she was drugged and sexually assaulted while in custody. Sky's home editor, Jason Farrell, has the story. Three women unconnected, but for their experience in a police station in Manchester. All say they were stripped naked without justification. One claimed she was raped in a police cell. No sexist police! No justice! No peace! There were demonstrations in Manchester and London after Sky News aired its investigation two weeks ago. Now there will be an independent inquiry into strip searches and the treatment of women in Greater Manchester Police custody. We caught up with Maria, not her real name, one of the women we featured. It's demonstrated to the public what is actually happening in police stations. And not just that police station, but other police stations as well across the country. We filmed Maria going to meet the head of the new inquiry, Dame Vera Baird, on Wednesday and spoke to her after the meeting. I went in and Dame Vera obviously explained what she's been commissioned to do by Andy Burnham. Vera says they should have given me a reason why I was being strip searched and they didn't. They didn't tell me why. Another woman we called Kirsty still hasn't seen any of the footage of her strip search after months of asking for it. She also went to meet the inquiry chair. She's the only chance we've got, isn't she? So we've got no choice. So I'll give her a chance, but it depends whether she does what she says because half of them don't do what they say. A third woman, Zaina Iman, used what's called a subject access request to obtain this footage of her being stripped whilst unconscious. She believes she was raped during her time in custody. Zaina was given most of the cell footage, but two hours were missing. Since our first report, Greater Manchester Police has tweeted that those two hours were corrupted, but they're trying to recover them. Zaina doesn't yet have faith in the inquiry. Whilst I welcome a public inquiry, um, I've been dealing with the police complaints procedure for over 30 months, and I've been let down, and I feel like I'm still being let down. 
Over 30 months later, sex offenders are still serving in Greater Manchester Police and public inquiries take time. The terms of the inquiry include not just strip searches, but also how women are treated in custody generally and how their complaints are treated. The report from Sky the other day has raised questions about the treatment of women uh, by Greater Manchester Police when they report crime, uh, when they're arrested, when they're in custody, if they are subject to a strip search, which um, obviously the mayor and I are concerned may reflect wider issues, systemic issues. The GMP say they have and will continue to positively engage with Dame Vera Baird's independent review. As the investigation into the complaints is now being led by the IOPC, we're not in a position to provide any further comment at this time. What I would like to see this review do is now is then expand to look at the ineffective police complaints procedure, to look at the ineffectiveness of the IOPC. In a previous statement, GMP told us there's no evidence to suggest any employees have misconducted themselves or committed a criminal offence. Jason Farrell, Sky News. 55 people dead, 1,000 unaccounted for. This week, the Hawaiian island of Maui has seen unprecedented wildfires that have flattened homes and businesses. Tonight, residents in the town of Lahaina will be allowed to return home briefly, but the pictures suggest they could be returning to ash-covered ruins with satellite images showing devastation for miles. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner reports from Maui in Hawaii. Rounding the corner past a stretch of luxury hotels. The devastation reveals itself. Into the town of Lahaina and the epicentre of the worst wildfire to hit the United States in years. Street after street, home after home here, reduced to rubble. This is where 55 people lost their lives. The search for the missing goes on. And this is where many people came to try and escape the full force of the flames. They were left with a choice, stay on land and burn or jump into the ocean. Most chose the latter. People clung to each other in the waves, embers flying overhead. Annalise was in the water for six hours with her neighbour, Edna. Burns from the flames cover her face. And we were going in and out of consciousness ourselves in the water, and we were both hallucinating. Um, but I just remember holding her hand and telling each other every few minutes, like, Edna, are you awake? Wake up. And, um, and holding each other for warmth. And then we would, um, every once in a while, we would get out of the water and we would go back up towards the fire just to warm our bodies. What, was there not enough warning? There was no warning. Thousands of people have been evacuated from Western Maui, many here to the local gymnasium. Adam was also in Lahaina when the fires hit. These videos taken from his apartment balcony. It sounded like a war zone because the propane tanks were going off. A lot of it was started in an industrial zone. So you had oxygen tanks, you had, it sounded like fireworks a little bit. He escaped by fleeing to the mountains above Lahaina but his home and town is gone. It's not just the, the loss of people here, then, it's also the loss of place. Um, it's, it's even more than that, it's the loss of your heart. Like, I don't even know what to do next. So after 15 years of building a life here, where do I start over even? And you know, wherever I start over, it's not gonna be Lahaina. In Hawaiian, the term Ohana means family and it's shining through here. Queues of people waiting to donate food and drink to the shelters. But the road to recovery will be a long one. Martha Kellner, Sky News, Maui.
Well, the fires have caused devastation right across Hawaii, in particular on the island of Maui, where images show the before and after scenes on the ground. Sky's international correspondent Alex Rossi has been analysing the pictures and looking at why the wildfires have spread just so quickly. They've been described by officials as the worst natural disaster in the state's history. Fueled by a dry summer and strong winds from a passing hurricane, the fire started on Tuesday. Several thousand residents raced to escape homes on Maui as a blaze swept across the island. The location worst hit by the fast-spreading wildfires has been the town of Lahaina. Now, to give you an idea of how much has been lost, we've some satellite images of the town from September last year. As you can see, there are plenty of homes and businesses running along the coast. And in pictures taken just on Wednesday, the flames have destroyed many of the buildings. Lahaina is historically important, dating back to the 1700s and was once the capital of Hawaii. Thousands have been made homeless and as many as a thousand buildings destroyed, but these fires haven't come from nowhere. According to US government data, 16% of Maui County is currently in a state of severe drought. And last year, the majority of the island was in severe drought for eight months. And researchers at the University of Hawaii have been looking at how many acres of land have been burnt throughout the last century. They say, on average, 5,000 acres were burnt each year between 1904 and the 1980s. Since then, the fires have increased roughly fourfold. In 2016, more than 20,000 acres were burnt. In 2018, more than 30,000. And in 2021, more than 40,000. We don't know yet the exact cause of these wildfires, but with Hurricane Dora moving away, the winds fanning the flames will drop, and it means the worst of the danger has hopefully now passed. But major rescue operations and investigations will continue for some time. Alex Rossi uh, with that report. An NHS patient who was told he had terminal kidney cancer has told Sky News his surgery was delayed four times because of staff shortages and strike action. Junior doctors walked out for a fifth time today over pay and working conditions. NHS providers have said the industrial action has cost about a billion pounds and that by the time this four-day walkout ends, a million procedures and appointments will have been cancelled. Well, the British Medical Association is currently calling for a 35% increase in pay to make up for real-term wage losses since 2008. But the government says the 6% pay rise with a one-off payment of £1,250 is a fair and final offer. Sky's health correspondent Ashish Joshi reports. People will die because of the delays. Andy says he's been to hell and back. A year ago, he was told his kidney cancer was terminal, but a later consultation gave him a second chance. Mentally, it kills you. Absolutely does your brain in. Four times, he feared, the opportunity was lost as his cryotherapy surgery was organised and then cancelled due to staff shortages or strike action. He came out and he shook his head. I'm sorry, mate, he said, we can't do it. Of course, it's so hard to describe. It's shattering, it just wears you out. A place tricks with your mind, the worry. Andy's stress is the same one felt by thousands of patients whose appointments have been canceled as junior doctors continue striking for better pay. Today, they brought their demands to the prime minister's door. Dr Robert Gittins has had enough. He told me he's quitting the NHS for a new life abroad. I'm looking to quit the NHS probably next year to move to Australia. There I've been um, hearing from my other colleagues how much better pay there is and how much better the working conditions are. The strikes impact everyone and the pressure is felt across the NHS. Patients have to be psychologically ready for that theatre. 
also um, they get work sorted, their family sorted, so we do our utmost to make sure that patient does not get cancelled on day of surgery. But despite these pressures, the two sides are nowhere near resolution. The government says its pay offer is final. We've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body process, but it's also right that we balance that with our wider commitment to bring inflation down because that matters to NHS staff just as it does to the community as a whole. Andy has finally had his surgery at the fifth attempt, only to face another agonising wait to find out that his treatment was successful. But he worries that if his cancer returns, he simply can't endure the anguish of the last few months. Ashish Joshi, Sky News. It was a little bit of good news today when it was revealed that the UK economy grew slightly in the three months to June. GDP increased by 0.2% in the second quarter of the year, while it rose 0.5% in June alone. Our business correspondent, Gurpreet Nawal, reports. The latest receipt for the UK economy, and it looks like the orders are still coming in. The cost of living crisis is still raging, but consumers and businesses are showing unexpected levels of resilience. Money is still being made in pubs and bars. People are being more savvy about how they spend. People are still coming out and, and staying as long as, as they have been, um, but perhaps they're not going to as many venues, so people are cutting back maybe on, on eating out but deciding they want to go and have an experience uh, like this. High inflation and interest rates are weighing heavily on the economy, but things aren't all bad. In places like this bar in central London, city workers are still finding money to spend. Some have secured chunky pay rises, and lockdown savings are still supporting spending. But there are doubts about how long it could all last. The UK economy beat expectations with growth of 0.2% in the three months to June. It managed 0.5% in June alone. All major sectors expanded. Manufacturing led the way with growth of 1.6% in the three months to June. The dominant services sector grew by 0.1%, while the construction sector expanded by 0.3%. All of this at a time when the Bank of England is increasing interest rates, squeezing the economy to tackle inflation. It's raised hopes that the country may avoid a recession in the process. When I started in office nine and a half months ago, recession was predicted. But of course, uh, it, you know, I would like that figure to be higher. You know, we've got a lot of work to do, but we're also in the context of the inflationary pressures we see in the economy at the moment. You know, it's obviously a delicate balancing act. But we aren't in the clear just yet. The twin challenges of high inflation and interest rates are still working their way through. At this plastics factory in Rutland, a major employer in the area, the order book is starting to feel the strain. What we are finding is that obviously construction is severely affected because of, because of interest rates. And actually, uh, construction affects a lot more than just bricks and mortar. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other components that go into construction. So that is affecting manufacturing in the UK at the moment. So we haven't dropped into recession just yet. But the problems are lining up and the outlook is uncertain. Gerprit Nawan, Sky News. Surrey police say three people wanted over the murder of a 10-year-old girl in Woking have left the country. The girl was found dead in a house in the village of Horsell during the early hours of yesterday morning. England captain Harry Kane has arrived in Germany from medical ahead of an £86 million move from Tottenham to Bayern Munich. The German champions are hopeful the striker will be available to make his debut when the new Bundesliga starts next week. Russia has launched its first mission to the moon in almost 50 years. The Lunar 25 craft is expected to reach the planet on the 23rd of August with the aim of collecting rock samples and dust to better understand the environment as a potential base. 
A mountaineer has told Sky News her team did not step over a dying man while climbing K2, one of the tallest peaks on the planet. The expedition was part of a record attempt with Kristin Harila becoming the fastest climber to scale the world's 14 highest mountains in 92 days. Sky's Sherman Freeman Powell reports. A moment of life and death captured in real time near the top of the K2. The group of climbers in this video can be seen just 1,300 feet away from the top of the world's second highest mountain. But rather than celebration, some face criticism after a porter collapsed on the route. Mohammed Hassan, a father of three, had slipped from a narrow ledge at around 8,200 metres. But a video shows part of a group climbing over him, pushing on to reach the summit. We are very happy to be here. Record-breaking mountaineer Kirsten Harila was among the climbers determined to set a new record, filming this video before she says she knew her son was dead. Harila, though, believes she and her team did everything they could. We tried to rescue him for many hours, and it's a very, very challenging and dangerous mountain, and we were probably on the most dangerous place and it was an accident and we tried what we could. But footage of the fatality captured by mountaineer Philip Flamig tells a different tale and so does he. It's really terrifying. They had to literally step over this body when he was lying there on this little ledge which is like this. All these people needed to pass him. He was still alive. In the next picture, I saw, okay, they are up. There was just one person rubbing him. Uh, I said, why, why didn't they brought him down? Some of the climbers have now met with Hassan's family who are coming to terms with their loss. But for those who were there with him at the end of his life, questions over whether they did all they could to save him. Shaman Freeman Powell, Sky News. England are playing Colombia in the World Cup quarter-final and the pressure is on after losing top scorer Lauren James to a two-match ban. Sweden's win against Japan means that this year's champions will be a first-time winner, but who could it be? England goalkeeper Mary Epps insists that the best is yet to come from the Lionesses. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris joins us now from Sydney. Rob. England are now clear favourites to win the Women's World Cup for the first time. They've seen so many contenders go home early, including the champions of the United States and now the Netherlands. And they'll be waking up here in Sydney this Saturday morning, though, knowing their World Cup journey could be over unless they beat Colombia here tonight. But fans have only seen glimpses of what they're capable of, Mary Earps insists, and they've got so much more to give but they have been underwhelming in three of their four games so far and they've relied so much on their goalkeeper to make this run to the quarterfinals. Smart stops, rapid reflexes and acrobatic agility. Without Mary Earps, would England be here in a World Cup quarterfinal? With three clean sheets in four games and Monday's penalty shootout success against Nigeria, the goalkeeper is a lioness being lauded. We try and block out as much of the noise as possible. Um, but I very much hope that they're praising goalkeepers because I think the performances have been fantastic and, and deserve a lot of credit. Um, but, yeah, still many games to go. Um, and hopefully those performances can continue uh, throughout the tournament. But you still can't buy one of these. More than 37,000 people have signed a petition urging Knight to start selling the replica shirt. I know that it's being looked into by the relevant parties um, at various levels and it will be a conversation that we pick up post-tournament. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone for their support on that. Support that will only grow if England can beat Colombia at Stadium Australia and reach a third consecutive Women's World Cup semi-final. It was so stressful for Serena Wiegmann against Nigeria. She's hoping it will be smoother for England here against Colombia but she's going to have to find a tactical plan that produces goals without top scorer Lauren James. This stamp saw James banned for two matches by FIFA, so she would only be available again if England reached the final. <laughs> Colombia have never made it to the quarterfinals before, 
but they've already helped to knock out two-time champions Germany. I hope we don't have that much stress. We, we know, we've seen in this tournament that not one game is easy uh, for anyone. Uh, it's so competitive. This World Cup keeps throwing up the unexpected. Spain are semi-finalists for the first time after a 2-1 victory over the Netherlands, runners-up four years ago. Next up for Spain, Sweden. Their fans delirious at getting past 2011 champions Japan 2-1 having already toppled the holders, America. We got Muzovic in the back and it's just amazing. Which team do you fear most ahead? None of them. There will be a new name on the Women's World Cup. Will it be England? Rob Harris, Sky News, Sydney. Looks fun. And that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we're going to take a first look at tomorrow's papers in the press preview. Of course, among the stories, we'll be discussing this on the front of Saturday's Mirror on the evacuation of the Bibby Stockholm. Uh, their headline, Deadly Bug on Barge. And tonight I'll be joined by the Daily Mirror columnist, Susie Boniface, and the political commentator, Benedict Spence. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. Do join us.
Hello again, you're watching Sky News. We've got the press preview for you in a moment, checking out uh, Saturday's front pages. But first, our top stories this evening. Asylum seekers have been removed from the Bibby Stockholm barge in Dorset after Legionella bacteria was found in the water supply. An independent inquiry into the experience of women and girls in police custody in Greater Manchester has been commissioned following a Sky News investigation. And at least 55 people are now known to have died and 1,000 people remain missing after wildfires on the Hawaiian island of Maui. So, as always, at this time, it's the press preview. A first look at what is on tomorrow's front pages. And uh, we're going to check out those headlines tonight with the Daily Mirror columnist Susie Boniface and the political commentator Benedict Spence. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Evening to both of you. Uh, we'll chat to you in a moment after we've had a look at some of those uh, front pages. Well, let's start with The Telegraph, leading with the Legionella scare on the Bibi Stockholm and warns that the vessel may be uninhabitable for weeks. Deadly bug on barge is the headline on the front of the mirror. And it's the same story on the front of The Guardian, uh, reporting that Home Secretary Swella Braverman is under pressure to abandon the barge accommodation plan altogether. A doctor's union has been accused of trying to bring down the government for masterminding roller skate... Uh, sorry, for masterminding rolling strikes, not rolling skates. That story on the front of the Daily Express, you can see it there. The Eye newspaper reveals a major security breach at the UK Foreign Office that allowed Chinese and Russian hackers to access emails and private messages. The Daily Mail reports on pressure on the Health Secretary to scrap NHS guidance that allows patients who temporarily identify as female to share female-only wards. Here's your FT for tomorrow, leading with a push by Saudi Arabia to join the UK, Italy and Japan in a next-generation fighter jet project. While The Times reports students face a battle for housing, with the universities refusing to guarantee accommodation or offering them rooms in different cities. And finally, a rise of the Sani psychos. The Daily Star reports on people tucking into cold baked beans and other unholy Sani combos. And uh, don't forget, you can scan the QR code at any time uh, during the programme. You'll see it on screen. Check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while uh, you watch us discussing them. And to, to do that tonight, Susie Boniface and Benedict Spence are both here. A very good evening to both of you uh, this Friday night. So, um, one story dominating uh, the front page is really Susie, and that is the latest twist in the story about uh, the uh, Bibby Stockholm. Uh, the Daily Telegraph reporting that migrants have been uh, taken off the barge. They're all off now uh, because of a Legionella scare. Yeah, um, I, I should just say that I think there'd be other stories on the front page if junior doctors were roller skating. Um, and that was probably one of the, 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 the scenes that got cut from the Barbie movie, junior doctors joining Ken and Barbie on their rollerblades. <laughs> what a pity. Uh, silly season, didn't get that far. Um, but no, as far as Legionnaire is concerned, so what's happened, back to the actual front pages, um, what's happened is that quite plainly um, the... The Conservative Party, the government, had planned into their media grid for this week small boats, and we're going to look tough and hard and mean. It's all going to be great. And we're going to say we're, we're doing one of Rishi Sunak's five pledges. In fact, the only one that anyone could remember what it is. And they managed to cock it up from beginning to end. So actually what happened is two weeks ago, they tested the pipes on the, the Stockholm for Legionnaire's disease, which is one of those things that you have to do. It takes two weeks, takes 14 days for those tests to come through. 14 days on the button on Monday, the contractors were told there does seem to be Legionnaire's disease on the boat. You can't use it. It then turns out it was Wednesday until the council in Portland told the Home Office. But then it was Thursday they moved another six migrants on board because the message doesn't seem to have got through. And Thursday evening before ministers were told... Uh, and then it's not Friday until they've actually been taken off. Now, what we don't know is at what point the migrants who are on there were told, guys, don't drink the water, because they should have clearly been told on Monday not to do that. Um, why it took so long to get to the ministers. And also, why on earth 
they put migrants on this barge when the checks hadn't been completed. Because I'll bet you my house, the reason that they went on there on Monday was because it was a small boats week and they wanted, after lots of delays to this barge policy, they wanted to say they were getting it done and they just cut corners and said, stuff it, get them on, the tests will be fine. And look where we ended up. And now it's another two, three, four weeks to flush the pipes, clean it all out again and do more tests to make sure that it's clear. Meanwhile, where are the migrants? Back in hotels. Uh, yes, and of course, uh, another uh, huge day of crossings yesterday. More than uh, 700 people making the most of uh, calm seas and better weather, Benedict. Uh, front mm. of the mirror, I mean, they're calling it migrant chaos. Deadly bug on uh, barges, their headline. I mean, it does all sound rather incompetent, doesn't it? I think, well, I mean... <laughs> What else do we come to expect from government at any level these days in this country other than people cutting corners, people not calling each other on the days that they're meant to and tell them, oh, by the way, there could be an outbreak of a deadly bacteria. But but who's to say? So it's only 40-odd people. Um, I think the first thing I do want to say is that from none of the front pages of any of the papers have we been able to glean uh, what uh, concentration of Legionella is uh, in on the BB Stockholm barge. So we don't actually know if they have been moved as a minor precaution because it's as just a trace amount, or if it is over 10 CFU per milliliters, in which case people have been drinking the water and they might well be hospitalized. And of course, part of the problem is it takes another two weeks for the symptoms to potentially emerge. So uh, there's going to be, I think, a lot of question marks for the next sort of fortnight as to whether or not it's a big outbreak or whether or not it's a it's a you know, not great, but just um, a reasonably safe tracer outbreak. But I think Susie is actually right. And it's it's come, as, as you say, at the start of the three month period where in 2022, 51% of the migrants who came to the UK across the channel came in this three-month period. And of course, the government wants to be seen to be getting tough on this. It has to, you know, the Prime Minister's gone on holiday. It needs to be seen to actually have a handle on things. Um, and what we had was, I think, almost, if not quite, the record number for a single day earlier this week crossing, combined today with people having to be taken off the barge, given that we only had a handful go onto the barge in the first place. And it all comes back to the fact that earlier this week, we crossed the 100,000 threshold since this started in 2018. That's a long time that the government has had, actually, to find a more permanent solution than a floating vessel to put people on whilst they're getting processed. And I think it's entirely justified for people of all persuasions, whether or not they think that these people should all be let in en masse, whether they think they should all be deported, or whether they are somewhere in the middle. I think it is perfectly reasonable for everybody to say, well, that's five years now, five years that there has been for the government to come up with um, a plan. And this big sort of, you know, uh, flagship policy of barges has had to be scaled back because it might be potentially dangerous to put people on the barges and still no planes are going to Rwanda. People aren't being deported back to their home countries, but they also don't have uh, t uh, permanent accommodation. We can't process them fast enough. And I think that, as you say, it sounds a little bit shambolic, frankly. OK, Susie, we'll have a quick look at the front of The Guardian as well, Asylum Barge Evacuated. I mean, do you think... Uh, do you think I mean, uh, there has been a suggestion that... Um, uh, they may never get back on board this boat, uh, and it really is the end of end of it. When it, in terms of uh, the Bibby Stockholm being a solution, do you, do, you, do you feel that that is a possibility? Well, well look, the Bibby Stockholm was never a solution because it could never take 172,000 asylum seekers. And our immigration problem, if you think we have a problem, is not the fact that we have 172,000 asylum seekers. If you are a dyed-in-the-wool racist who thinks there are too many migrants then your issue is the legal migration with the people who are given visas and of whom are about five or six times in number of what we have who are seeking asylum. The people who were going onto the barge and the people who are seeking asylum are the vast majority of them, despite the fact the Home Office don't like putting the numbers out. We think the vast majority are asylum seekers. They have a genuine right to be here and they do get approved in the end. Um, and the, all that the barge was, was a ploy. It was a... Uh, an image, a symbol, something that the government could wave to say, look how cruel we are to people. This is going to work. And it was never going to deal with the, the fundamental issues of the small boat crossings or immigration. It was only ever a PR exercise. And it's been handled incredibly badly by people who can't even manage a PR exercise. So the chances of them actually being able to fix the fundamental problem of immigration, much of which is caused by climate change and so on, is utterly mm. beyond them.
OK, um, all right, well, we'll discuss this more um, after 11 o'clock, but I just want to move on to the front of the Daily Express, Benedict. Uh, doctors striking again, and, and there's a real stalemate here, isn't there? I mean, I find the, the the way that the Express has framed this, doctors are striking to bring down the Tories, is particularly interesting. I mean, presumably, if you are uh, a member of a profession and you think that the government of the day is not fulfilling its its role towards you, um, it's not an awful thing to want to see that government change if it's not actually going to change its policies. And I think actually that throughout this uh, this very sorry episode, we've seen that the government is, you know, dragging its heels, frankly, on something that it knows has to be addressed. Everybody who works in the NHS knows something has to change. It can't carry on in its permanent state. So to simply frame it like that and say, oh, the doctors are trying to bring, bring down the Tories, you're going to go, well, yeah, them and about a thousand other professions as things are currently working out. Um, it is... It, you know, it, it, it is you know, a, a, a bit of a gridlock, a bit of a deadlock at the moment, but ultimately the public will not put up with it. And you know, we're, we're coming towards an election now uh, in the next sort of 12 to 18 months, and people will look at the Tories' record over the last few years and say, do I feel richer? Do I feel poorer? Are the queues at the hospital longer? Are they shorter? All of these sorts of things. And the Tories fail on pretty much every metric. So I don't think it's the doctors that are fighting to bring down the Tories. I think the Tories are doing a perfect job of that themselves. Susie? <laughs> <laughs> I think Benedict's doing a marvellous job of being a liberal lefty commentator. <laughs> I don't even say anything at all anymore. He's done no, I'm just before. despondent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susie, what, what are your thoughts on, 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 on the latest round of uh, strikes? Junior doctors being offered 6% uh, pay rise, of course, plus uh, a payment. The government saying that that is uh, their best and final offer. Um, doctors still calling for the equivalent of 35%. Well, at least be somewhere there's a negotiation and you meet somewhere in the middle. The fact is there isn't much negotiating happening. I think if they live stream those negotiations, uh, all sides might behave a little bit better when they're in the room and might do a little bit more hard work rather than posture when they're outside the room. But, you know, the, the express front page is a bit mad. Not every doctor's striking. Not every doctor is a is a labor lunatic uh and not every doctor is a is a Tory twit either. They're they you know, there's a People are allowed to have political views and some of them are striking because they want to fix the problem in the NHS and they want to demonstrate how bad it is. And others are not striking because they feel that they can't. It's a personal decision for everyone involved. And as Benedict says, everyone who takes go, takes strike action, it you know, is technically trying to bring down the government, I suppose, if they're asking for a public sector pay rise. But also, they just they're just trying to get their message across. You know, people strike sometimes in private companies as well. They're not trying to bring the boss of the company to their knees. They're just trying to be heard. OK, Labour lunatics and toy twits. Uh, I love it. All right, stay where you are. We will chat again in a minute. Uh, coming up after the break on the press preview, we'll be looking at a story on the front of the FT as King Charles may get a 45% pay rise, stirring anger amongst Republicans. Don't go away.
Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. It's really desperate. That is actually the sort of pretty much hopeless column. We saw snatch words going in, grabbing people. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We'll take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. An well, enormous explosion has just come down. It's not out of control, but they've withdrawn. It's so, oh, so hot. Welcome back, part two of the press preview. Benedict and Susie still with us. Benedict, front page of the eye. Um, there's been a lot about uh, cyber hacking uh, and data leaks uh, in recent days, uh, the most serious, uh, of course, in Northern Ireland. But this is an interesting exclusive by the eye. Uh, a Foreign Office employee downloaded one of those pesky emails with malware in them, probably accidentally, according to the eye, but it opened the door to... Um, uh, the top Whitehall network and uh, able to access emails and private messages. Yes, yeah, a major security breach. And, you know, one suspects we're going to be hearing a lot more of these sorts of things as, you know, the world becomes increasingly multipolar and uh, we embrace the fact that we're sort of in a, a new Cold War against certain powers, China and Russia being amongst them. There was, of course, the story a couple of weeks ago about uh, the, uh, the the security cameras outside uh, MI6 uh, being Chinese-run uh, and accessible from Beijing. Uh, you know, so uh, there will be lots of these sorts of things. But I think it's the, the first thing is to, to recognize that this was, uh, the, as security sources say, uh, probably unintentional. So that's uh, it's not brilliant for security protocol, but you know it, 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 we haven't been sort of infiltrated or anything like that. The second thing <laughs> I think to say is these stories, you'll ever, only ever hear the negative stories. You'll never, ever hear the stories about how we've managed to hack the Chinese or the Russians, which I guarantee you we do do, because I know we like to think of them all as masterminds, but they too will have people who will very sillily click on links and emails and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, that, we need to take this in proportion, um, is that, you know, we are doing to them exactly what they're doing to us. But the third thing that I would say is, as we are so dependent, especially on China and Chinese technology, there are always going to be windows through which China especially is going to be able to get access to certain things in the UK. Now, if it's the electoral register, that's not the end of the world. But as you referenced there, you know, uh, the PSNI or access to the foreign office or whatever it is, sometimes they might actually come across something that functions properly. Uh, I don't know what that might be, but they might. And that is slightly concerning. Uh, Susie, a quick thought on this? <laughs> Uh, I, I think if they did find anything that would function properly, it would be great if they could flag it up to us and we'd know yeah, what they let us know. Um, <laughs> I think I think possibly that Benedict's a positive view that uh, the good thing about this is that it was done accidentally. It was just a blunder. Is perhaps a little bit optimistic, <laughs> you know, rather than malign intent. We just oh, we just let the hackers in because oh, why not? What's the point in having firewalls these days? Um, just download stuff off the internet. No one will mind. It's okay. Said James Bond. Terrible idea. Um, some of this stuff it does include correspondence from our diplomats abroad. Although it might not be classified, it is still important. It is still things that feed into government policy, and it can still be things, as uh, some of the WikiLeaks have shown, things that are, are diplomats sayable, which can be a bit embarrassing if they mm. get published. And I'm fairly sure that someone's probably going through them right now.
Yeah. OK, we've just got um, uh, about 30 seconds left, Benedict, to look at this story on the front page of the FT. Uh, the King's looming 45% pay rise stirs Republican anger. Now, this is all about uh, the income that he gets from Crown ownership of the seabed and offshore wind mm. projects. Now, I, I thought he said that he was going to give profits back um, to, the, to the public good from, from those wind farms. What, what's this story about? Well, it, it remains to be seen whether or not he will do that. But who would have thought that, you know, investing in the seabed would have turned out so well for the royal family? Who would have, who would have thought that being such a large landowner would pay such dividends? Um, I mean, 45 percent, it's staggering, really. And you, you consider how much it is that we are investing in renewables, especially in, in wind. And we all thought that offshore would you know, be a lot cheaper. And it turns out that somebody's making an absolute fortune from it. And who does it happen to be? Oh, the man that doesn't actually need any more money. Uh, but we, we wait to see what he will do with it. You know, King Charles is a, is a big uh, charitable giver. He has lots of uh, causes that he's very interested in. So let's wait and see. Maybe he will give it to good causes, or maybe he'll use it to renovate uh, Buckingham Palace. Who, who knows what, what he'll do with <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, OK. We probably need to, uh, to, to read more of that story from inside uh, the FT. Perhaps we'll get that uh, in the next hour. Benedict, uh, Susie, thank you both very much for the moment. We will chat again in a few minutes' time. Right now, we're going to have a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, I hope you enjoyed the warm spell uh, today and yesterday because cooler and fresher conditions are coming with a scattering of showers, I'm afraid. Eastern parts of Britain will have a mostly fine start to Saturday morning, but further west it will be cloudier and windier as bands of showery rain move in off the Atlantic. Overall, it's set to be a breezy day with a mix of sunny spells and scattered blustery showers, especially in the northwest. Temperatures will be down a few degrees, back to near average for the time of year. Further bands of showery rain will move east through the day, heaviest and possibly thundery for Northern Ireland. To fly, to fly.